We all learned last night that police officer Jonathan Diller of the N New York Police Department was killed. Today we also learned that he attended Franklin Square schools and was at Cary High School through eighth grade, at which point he transferred to a local parochial school. I'd like to read a letter posted on the Franklin Square website. Officer Diller exemplified the very best of our community, dedicating his life to serving and protecting others as an officer for the New York Police Department. His unwavering commitment to justice, compassion, and courage inspired those who had the privilege of knowing him. It has been shared by the staff that Officer Diller ex exhibited ex outstanding character, leadership, and integrity during his time at John Street School. He, em he embodied the values we strive to instill in all our students, leaving a legacy of courage that will continue to inspire future generations. I'd also like to add that while Police Officer Diller was not a graduate of the Sawanica Central High School District, we join with many others in expressing our condolences to his family and the NYPD. We honor his service and mourn his loss. And please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. I have a motion to approve the minutes of February 27, 2024, budget and regular board meeting. Ms. Peltonen, Ms. Rudd, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any correspondences? No. Awards and commendations? We have a few, a few. tonight that I'm, I'm so happy to be playing a part of. Uh, the first one is a, a, a gentleman that we've introduced before, and I'm not sure if he's here or not, but Tonight, I'm talking about him because Youssef Latif, uh, has, is Youssef here? We know he's involved in like a thousand other activities. I, I promise you we'll get him his certificate, but I am so proud to advise the community that Youssef is one of 150 high school seniors who will each receive a $20,000 college scholarship and join a family of 6,900 alumni as a Coca-Cola scholar. Less than one Less than one-sixth of one percent of applicants were chosen to receive this, receive this exemplar, extremely competitive award. These 150 students exemplify superior leadership, service, and academics. They are change agents, positively affecting others in their communities. Congratulations to Youssef. You have made us all proud. I know our next honoree is here because I just spoke to her out in the lobby. Um, I am so pleased to introduce uh, uh, one of many athletes we have with us tonight, but uh, this one, a unique track star who I think is here with her coach, Michael Graham. Michael, you here? Yeah. Did he, Michael come in? Michael, Coach Graham, thank you very much for your service. And congratulations to Ashley Fulton of Elmont Memorial High School. <laughs> Ashley broke the record in the New York State and Federation champion 300 meter dash. Ashley, please come up and accept this commendation. Next, we have an award for a kegler. Does anybody know what that is? No. Mr. Messenger, very good. A few, few people knew what it was. Kegler's a bowler. You knew that? Very good. A kegler's a bowler. And we are pleased to honor Liam Sushko of H. Frank Carey High School, who also attends Sawanica during the day. Liam was not only chosen for the bowling All-State team, he also bowled at that tournament a perfect game of 300 and was named the Newsday High School Athlete of the Week. Yeah. 
you may have read this, but Liam's response to bowling a 300 was disappointment that he could never bowl a better game than that. Well, Liam, we think that one was pretty good. Congratulations. You want to join me? I think that's it on the, oh no, no, there's one of the group. <laughs> so we are here tonight to honor the New York State champion Elmont boys basketball team. Gentlemen, congratulations. <laughs> So I learned something about this team today. I was speaking to Coach uh, Reggie Gay, and uh, he, he finished a story for me. Um, I said to, to Coach you know, what a, how remarkable it is when a loss can result in so much victory. And what I was thinking of was a game that took place last year uh, in a championship game when you were beaten by Southside. And that motivated you throughout the year. Good for you. What I didn't know and I, what I learned tonight was the day after the Southside game last year, most of you were back in the gym. The next day after losing the game, there you are in the gym. And that's what got you to this championship this year. I've also learned that after you won the New York State championship this year, the next day, many of you were back in the gym. That's a real statement about your commitment to the sport, your team, and your school. And I congratulate you. So, uh, with your permission, I'm going to introduce the, the, your head coach first, because I'm going to ask him to assist me uh, handing out some of these certificates so that when I call the names, uh, he'll know who to give it to. Uh, I've learned that Coach Straub is not only an outstanding basketball coach, I congratulated him this year at a volleyball uh, game, a championship game, did a great job there. And in talking about you today, I also learned that you're a rock star math teacher. Uh, to, and when I, when, I, when I said that, when I said, when I said that to Ryan, he said, yeah, I, I, I guess I can do both. So yeah, I guess you can. Ryan, if you'd come up and take this, and then I'm going to call some other names. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, we'll all go in the well, so that way they can take a few pictures of you when you're done. All right. Okay, here we go. To complete the coaching staff, we have several assistant coaches. Thank you very much to Alan Smith, Travis Robinson Morgan, and Reggie Gay. Coaches, come on up. No team or organization uh, succeeds without management. We have our team managers with us here tonight, Hyatt Ahmad, Julius Sylvain Jenkins, and Angel Anderson. I'm going to ask two other people to come up to congratulate you as, as you come up, and those are your athletic director, Mr. Crew Patel. Crew, come on up. And a person who, as you may or may not know, suffered a very serious injury during the season, um, and that's your principal. Ms. Baker. Ms. Baker was actually swinging that pom-pom so vigorously. <laughs> Wait, I kid you not. 
at, at the game at Farmingdale that at the second game at Farmingdale, she couldn't do it because she had bursitis from swinging it so much. <laughs> now, I hope I have not betrayed any HIPAA rights there by, by sharing that. And I did check, she's better today, but I know what a fan she's been, and I would absolutely ask Ms. Baker to come up and congratulate the team. And with that, the New York State champion varsity basketball team from Elmont High School made up of Khalil Muhammad. Cassius Moore. Osaji Ekator. Nasir Edwards. Ibu Wabudu. Arlen Brown. Caleb Harris. Jameer Frias Walsh. Kamani Diaz. Jordan Cook. Darian Prophet. Kiyun Kahan. Aiden Barnes. And Aaron Kelly. Uh, we, always, we always have a great showing of building administrators at our meetings, and I'll tell you right now, if any of you want to sneak out, we can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> but gentlemen, congratulations. I think we're going to take a couple of pictures, and uh, then there's one other person on before you leave. That's funny. He was a good player. I don't know why it happened. <laughs> Not a significant assist, but like those yeah. memories. Oh, are yeah. One last person who I'd like to honor, because not all of us could make it to all of the games. This person made it to all of the games. And because he was there, he was able to be on his phone, sending us scores by the minute, by the quarter, by the half. And the, I'm telling the board now, were it not for this gentleman, I would not have been able to be sending you those scores. And we've emphasized this year, district and the way that we are all interconnected. And uh, I can't help but think that this exemplifies that, uh, and that's the support that this team received from someone who was affiliated with the team the last time it won the state championship, our assistant principal from Floral Park, Mr. Kevin Sullivan.
Mr. Wright and I were just saying how, how significant a moment this is for you, and we know that, but trust us, it's going to become more significant 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. It's going to dawn on you what you've achieved, and I know we realize that now, and we really appreciate what all of the athletes that we've honored tonight, uh, and the basketball team uh, especially, what you've done for us and what you've done for the Swanica District and Elmont High School. Congratulations and thank you. Congratulations. Great job. Now, to those athletes, um, we are now going to have a scintillating report from the Nassau County Fire Marshal, uh, followed by an exciting budget presentation, uh, followed by a lengthy superintendent's report that usually goes on a little bit too long. Um, you're welcome to stay, but I know you all have homework to do. And we'd understand, we'd understand, we understand that you're torn, but uh, we'll take a couple of minutes break and allow everybody to uh, make that decision on, on which they're going to do. It is live streamed if you want to run home and turn it on, all right? Thank you. Thank you, Coach. Great job. Ibu, did I get it right? All right. <laughs> I'm going to do Tim Green first, and then I'll do the budget. Maybe, maybe Kevin O'Brien will show up by then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good job, Matt. Thank you, Coach. Yeah. yeah, or volleyball. I'm Although not sure which one. Yeah. Six, ten, never, never touched the ball at all. Isn't that funny? Yeah. And you can't teach size. That's no. the one thing you can't one teach. Thing you can't teach right? Yeah. All right, we're going to keep going if that's okay. Well. Yousef. Ah. Excellent. Okay, I did not say anything about this gentleman before. Yousef, hang on, I got some things to say about you. One, thank you for being here. We're honored by your presence. Because of all that you've accomplished this year, but for this occasion, for tonight, we honor you as a Coca-Cola scholar. Uh, we're thrilled to announce that Elmont Memorial High School senior Youssef Latif is officially a member of the 36th class of Coca-Cola Scholars, one of 150 high school seniors who will receive a $20,000 college scholarship and join a family of alumni who are leading positive change in their communities. Less than one-sixth of one percent of applicants are chosen to receive this extremely competitive award, and these 150 students were selected because they exemplify superior leadership, service, and academics. They are change agents positively affecting others in their communities. Youssef, we thank you for bringing such great honor to the district, and we congratulate you on this achievement. Well done. Awesome, Mom. Get good. This is a great moment.
I'll mention this school again in a later report, but Youssef's headed off to a little school in Rhode Island called Brown University. Good luck, Youssef. Nice. Wow, Tim, tough act to follow, right? <laughs> uh, I've worked with Tim for 30 years, uh, and I know the quality of the work that he does and the care. Um, he can be an ornery uh, person when it comes to student safety and keeping our buildings safe. And uh, each year he offers a report to the Board of Education on the basis of his inspection. I'll ask you, Tim, if you would, to come to the podium and give your report to the Board. Uh, press the button. I'm sure we will. Thank you, Tim. Thanks very much. You want to introduce me? Now we're going to move into the budget presentation. Dr. Dong will present it to us in his, in his elegant way of presentations. I'm going to move out of the way. Unfortunately, Mr. O'Brien couldn't be with us tonight. He's under the weather, uh, and uh, we gave him um, most of the night off. Uh, I told him to be here by 8.15. Um, I don't know where he is, but uh, 
all kidding aside, I'm going to do the budget presentation tonight. And I learned something from a teacher at New Hyde Park in an observation I was doing, Kristen Flood, who is a business teacher at New Hyde Park. And in my post-observation with her, she, she has a sign on her desk that says, 95% uh, of what you teach, you learn best. Uh, that is, when you have to explain something to somebody, that's when you really learn it. So I've had a chance to really Im get involved in the budget, uh, and I'm prepared to present it to you tonight. So at this point, I've said this before, this is the superintendent's budget. And all I mean by that is, is the board has yet to accept the budget, and we're here to propose to the board. Uh, the Board of Education has been very helpful, has offered a lot of feedback on it. Um, they've been very involved in this process, and I don't think anything in here will come as a big surprise to them. The budget is divided into three parts. There's an administrative, a program, and a capital part. The administrative is constituted of the items that are listed there. Uh, predictably, a lot of the administration of the district, the way the district is organized uh, centrally, um, curriculum development is an administrative function, building level supervision, and our chair people. That administrative portion is going up approximately 4.77% going from 29.4 to 30.8 million dollars. Uh, I'm going to break down the percentages of those uh, before we're done and show you uh, where the money is going uh, across the district. And I think you'll, you'll be pleased to see where we're spending our money. And most of it is in this portion of the budget, the program, that which our kids are exposed to, instruction, special ed, library. Uh, PPS, health services, extracurricular, uh, those two, extracurricular and interscholastic activities, the things that many of us probably remember from school, uh, and that is considered part of the program that we offer to students. Transportation is in there, and that's a big item. Uh, and then interfund transfers, special aid, and school lunch. Uh, a school lunch is a separate account, and uh, we're very fortunate. Ours is in very good shape. Within the program is curriculum, and we are happy that there are many innovations being offered in this year's budget. Uh, the first of those is the full implementation of social studies curriculum, which allows for the very first time with the class of 2024, the acquisition of the New York State Seal of Civic Readiness. This is the first year that all of our students will be eligible for that, and we anticipate many, if not most, of our students achieving that. Uh, we'll be pleased to report on that number as we get closer to graduation. Uh, the second item, we are expanding and extending dual enrollment course offerings. This is one that's really near and dear to my heart. Uh, I'm sure we remember uh, AP courses from when we were in high school, and you may or may not remember the frustration when you would take an AP course, uh, take the test, get a four or a five, and then a college would say, no, uh, you know, we're, we're going to require you to take the course anyway. In a dual enrollment course, you take a course here at one of our five schools, you receive high school credit, counts towards graduation credit, but you also receive college credit. You receive a transcript. That transcript can be walked into any other college that you attend. So it's not a question of a school saying, no, we're not going to accept that. You've got a transcript. If they usually accept St. John's credits, they're going to take your credits, just as if you were a transfer student. There's one special school that I want to speak about that we've tried to really emphasize this year, and that's the S State University of New York. SUNY has a program called Seamless Transfer, and that means that if you take any course at any SUNY campus, it must be accepted by every other SUNY campus. You take a course at Geneseo, it must be accepted at Albany. You take a course at Brockport, they have to take those credits at Stony Brook. Might not count towards your major, but they must take the credits, seamless transfer. So therefore, we've tried to expand our relationship with SUNY schools because by doing so, we're presenting our kids with a chance to finish four or five courses while they're here at Sumanica. And if they were to do so, they've completed a semester of a SUNY college. They would head off to any other SUNY college and you'd be a, a second semester freshman to start. The college we're working with is Nassau, and they do have the right to claim uh, us. And what I mean by that is if we want to offer a sociology course, uh, we have to ask Nassau to sponsor it first. Uh, there have been some 
cases where they've not accepted us um, because they don't feel that our staff has met the, the requirements that they would hope, but uh, we are working very hard with them. Dr. Johnson is on the phone at least weekly uh, with the Dean of Admissions, Dave Follick, over at Nassau, and that's a program that we really hope to expand, knowing that the college credits that our kids earn here are, are going to be fungible when they head off to college. Uh, the third one, the implementation of phase two of the CTE medical assisting program. I've, I've been a visitor over to phase one this year. Uh, next year, we will be working over at Elmont High School, and our students will also be working through PM Pediatrics, doing internships over there. Uh, focus support in our English as a New Language program. We're going to emphasize to a, a greater degree than, than we have the services that we provide to our youngest students, recognizing that as students arrive, if they don't speak English, if we can get them up to speed quickly, they're going to succeed faster. So that focused effort is one that we're going to emphasize by way of this budget. Of course, continuation of our STEM programs, 7 through 12. Uh, we are right now writing a grade 7 and grade 10 curriculum. It will be presented in April and will be implemented in September. Uh, and, and the reason this is in the budget is we, uh, you know, people are compensated for writing the curriculum and those funds are available. We'll be implementing it next year and there'll be staff development along the way. Implementation of an enhanced English language arts curriculum in grade 10. Similarly, we're writing that curriculum now. An implementation of the New York State Science Learning Standards in Science 7 and 8, but also notably, living environment is becoming biology. The course is changing, so we have to write a new curriculum. And a course that many of us are familiar with, Earth Science, is now becoming Earth and Space. The name of the course is changing, but so is the emphasis in the course. Uh, implementation of a world language curriculum focused on language acquisition, not the drill and kill that we might have been familiar with, uh, an understanding by design focus uh, in, for, in world languages. And finally, uh, we will continue professional development with our staff in areas including co-teaching, uh, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and literacy across content areas. All of those are funded by the program portion of the budget. I'm sorry, yes, the program. Uh, on which we're spending this year $193,300,000, an increase of 3.76%. That is the bulk of the increase in our budget, uh, $7 million going towards program. Capital. Capital represents buildings and grounds, security, debt service. Uh, we, all, we, we all have debt service. Transfer to capital projects. And that looks like this. 28.9 this year, going up to 31.526 next year. Let me talk to you a little bit about the capital projects that we are pursuing. Sorry for the small print. I will read all of them so that you know that they're there, and this will be on the website as well. Um, I'm pleased to report that the, in the five buildings, every project our principals have asked for are being implemented this year. If they asked for it, we're doing it. We're lucky to be able to do that. Of note, at Elmont, uh, we're reno renovating the boys and girls bathroom by the guidance department. I need to talk and be completely transparent about the timing on that. We cannot proceed with this project until after the budget's approved. So sometime after May 21st, that is when we will start to go to bid. That is when we will start to design those bathrooms. That is when we'll seek permission from New York State. We have to seek permission from the state in order to receive building aid. You'll see that addressed later on. So we are not going to break ground on those bathrooms on July 1st. I don't think we're going to have permission to start that project until August 1st. We're not going to start the project on August 1st. If we were to start on August 1st, we'd be opening school with those two bathrooms right opposite the guidance suite, down the hall from the main office as construction sites. I don't think that's wise. Rather, I'm going to propose that we do all of the planning this summer, additional planning during the school year, and actually break ground on it July 1st, 2025. Students will not be around. We know we can complete the project. We believe we can complete the project in those eight weeks, and it won't disrupt instruction, which I'm sure you understand is our primary mission. Please remember that next year. You know, it's in the budget. It's paid for, but we're not going to be able to begin construction on it until actual uh, dem demolition until July of 2025. I'll replace the front concrete sidewalk. We're going to install a press box that has never existed over at Elmont High School. We do know the date of their homecoming, and that is the date that we're shooting for. We're going to try to get that up by the Elmont homecoming. Uh, exterior doors uh, will be replaced at 8, 9, 11, and 12. 
At Floral Park, uh, exterior doors in a couple of locations, sidewalk installation in the courtyard, second floor locker replacement by the elevator, and north side perimeter fence replacement by the auditorium. Carry, uh, a gymnasium ceiling. If you go into our gym and look up, you'll see that the, the gym ceiling is in pretty desperate need of repair. We're going to tear that down and repair it. Uh, one that I know is especially near and dear to the heart of the principal. We're going to replace the carpet in the library, something she has been asking for since July 1st, 2023. Uh, we're going to get that done. Custodial parking lot replacement, vacuum and condensate pump replacement, interior courtyard door, perimeter fence, and the water heater replacement in the boiler room. At New Hyde Park, more exterior doors, replace the carpet in the library, vacuum and condensate pump replacement, and replace and extend the small lot by the tennis courts. And finally, at Sawanica, mason repairs, concrete replacement in the front of the building, science table installation, and football tower renovation. There is a, a, a press box of sorts out there now, but it could certainly use uh, an, uh, some upkeep and an enhancement, and that's what we're going to do. And that will hopefully be done by your homecoming uh, date still to be determined. Ms. Ms. Allen and I are talking about that. Uh, for the district, um, if any of you uh, have visited me at all this year and, and seen the central office uh, and you've seen that big bulky sweater that I wear, you'll know that we need, need a new heating system. Um, the heating system needs to be repaired. Uh, we are going to do that and I know you can't read it but that one's at a cost of about $125,000. So if you look at the three-part budget, and you were to total everything up, we're going from 244 million up to 255 million, an increase of 11 million dollars, 4.5 difference in terms of our expenditures. But here's the number that's not up there that I think we can be proud of. The administrative portion of the budget is approximately 11 or 12 percent. The program, 76 percent, and the capital, another 12 percent. 76% of what we're spending is on program. That portion of the budget that I spoke about is the, the deliverables to students. And that's the way it should be. That is where the bulk of our spending should be. Where's the money come from? Um, a, a dear friend of mine used to say, you never talk about the revenue side of the budget. We're going to speak about that briefly. Where does the money come from? Our projected state aid is $72 million which means that the local revenue, the tax levy, and not, I'm sorry, the local revenue, 182781000 for a total of that 255707 Let's break that down just a little bit. State aid, I love this chart because it really shows you um, kind of the, the, the circumstance that schools are in right now. 22-23, we received $58 million in state aid. Last year, we received an increase of $13 million. It jumped up to 71.6. This year, our increase is 10% of that. It's going up 1.325. And I, I, I hasten to note, that's proposed. That is, we don't have a state budget yet. Uh, truthfully, I think it is going to be increased a little bit. Awful lot of pressure is being brought to bear up in Albany uh, for a lot of districts uh, to receive aid, and we hope that we can uh, get, on, get on that uh, train with them. But that huge increase we saw last year is what other schools experienced also, and I think it's the trap that some of them fell into. Um, we're all reading about districts that are making huge cuts in staff, uh, 60 in one district that I know of, 60 teachers, 30 secondary, 30 elementary. Uh, we've seen headlines about other schools. Um, they invested, over-invested perhaps, and uh, now they don't have the money to continue those expenses. Uh, we're not in that predicament, as I will exchange, explain in just a minute. So state aid comes in various forms. There's foundation aid, which is based on enrollment, uh, special needs, and local economics. Uh, BOCES aid, those are the shared services that we have with BOCES. High cost excess aid, uh, private cost excess aid, which assists us uh, to pay for public school students who are attending private school, special education students who are attending private schools. Building aid, which is a percentage of what we spend, we get back from the state. Same with transportation aid. Hardware and technology aid, those are expenditures that are reimbursed. Uh, not all of them, but some. And the same with software, library, and textbook aid. And high tax aid, that goes to districts whose residents pay a comparatively high percentage of their income on property taxes. Uh, I note that only because if you hear that definition and you see it's only $889,000, um, that's kind of a surprise because we're certainly in an area uh, where 
property taxes take up a, a big piece of everybody's mortgage. General fund local revenue, where is the money coming from? The tax levy is the amount that we propose to raise among the community. That is what you will be paying towards uh, the support of our schools. Uh, we've said in the past that we don't get pilots. This is the only pilot we get. We do get a LIPA pilot from the elementary districts um, for substations. Uh, a pilot is a, pilot, a payment in lieu of taxes. Uh, because the utility companies don't pay taxes, they offer us money instead for substations, believe it or not, telephone poles, telephone wires, anything, any uh, 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 tangible item that exists within the district, uh, we do receive a, some money for. And those are the only pilots we do receive that this district receives. Uh, allocation from the fund balance, that is the money that we will carry forward into our budget for next year. And then the next line, reserves applied, that's significant because that's a, a pretty big decrease from uh, our last meeting, and I'll detail that in just a minute. Uh, miscellaneous revenue, 2.5 million, and transfer com from capital, 200,000. That's our total revenue, 182 million, 761,000. So this is the tax cap. <laughs> It's an incredibly complex formula. Um, I encourage you to look at it. <laughs> I'm not going to do this to you tonight. But it is, um, it has additions and subtractions and things you get credit for and things you lose credit for. And what it ends up being is the number that you're allowed to increase your tax levy by. It's called the 2% tax cap. That's a terrible misnomer because it rarely is it exactly 2%. That's kind of where you start. But when we get all done, our tax levy, our tax levy cap is 2.46, which is up a little bit from our last meeting. That means we can raise a little bit more money. Uh, we will be coming in under the tax cap. I think that's important to do. Uh, and uh, I, I believe this, this district's done that consistently. So the general fund revenue, state aid projected 72.9. Local revenue, 182, and there's that number again, 255, 707 for the total budget. The increase in expenditure, 4.5%. The total budget to budget increase, 11 million, uh, which is a, a large number that deserves some explanation. The situation we have is state aid is increasing 1.3 million, but, and our tax levy cap is increasing 4 million, the budget's going up 11 million. Why? Uh, sorry, I, did I skip a slide? Uh, I'll, nope, I'll, I'll get to it. I'm sure it's, I'm sure I'll get to it. Uh, the plan is for us to reduce the expenditure budget as much as we can without negatively impacting students. That is, spend as little as we can. And we have, uh, and we've discussed this with the board, increased our use of reserves and fund balance to close the gap between what we can raise in revenue and what our expenditures are. Expenditures. We plan to reduce 2024, 25 salaries and benefits through a retirement incentive to eligible employees. Tonight, you're going to hear the board rescind a retirement incentive and then immediately act on a new one. We're rescinding it because there's a, a different way that we can do it that will benefit those retirees and the district by putting the money into a non-elective 403B. Benefits us, benefits them. Uh, that retirement incentive was extremely successful and in fact saved us almost three million dollars in salaries and I will speak to that in my report tonight. We've also analyzed expenditure codes uh, the word scrub is one that's absolutely been overused by all of us this year, but that is what we've done. We've gone line by line through the budget to make sure that our actual expenditures uh, are what is needed and, and not very much more. Uh, we've identified other areas for cost containment and we've contemplated staff reductions. Uh, tonight, I'm very pleased to announce that other than the retirement incentive and uh, some individuals who will not be returning uh, by our choice uh, for performance reasons, uh, there will be no other reductions in staff. And I know that's kind of a headline compared to what we've heard from other school districts. Uh, anybody who we are, uh, 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 anybody who's retiring this year, we're going to absorb their position. Uh, decrease the expenditure budget in that way, not replace them. And if there are other uh, people who leave over the summer, we're going to look very carefully and ask that question. Does this position, must this position be replaced? 
Uh, I give a lot of credit to our principals and our uh, master schedulers. They've done a great job of figuring out exactly how much staff we need, and we can move forward with this budget because of that. Uh, we're increasing the amount of the reserves and fund balance to be used. And I think I have those numbers here. We're going from, actually, it's in my report. So if you'll forgive me, in a minute, I'm going to get to that slide. And uh, I'll tell you exactly how much we're going to be using in reserves and in the fund balance. We understand we can't use the reserves and fund balance every year. This is just the first step in, in uh, uh, a different direction for the budget. And we will continue this into the future. So the jo total budget, 255, 707, 308. Uh, the election date, very important, May 21st, 2024. We encourage your participation, and, and it's very important. Um, you've heard me uh, wax poetic about the, the democratic nature of this process. This is the only budget you get to vote on. This is the only budget where those who develop the budget and, and are responsible for it have to ask you for your support. And I like that. Uh, this is, uh, in many ways, democracy's last stand. Uh, this is our chance to involve everybody in this process. I'm pleased to see some new faces here tonight. And we do ask you for your support. Uh, I apologize. I think I've left a slide out here, but I have some other data that I will include in just a couple of minutes in my uh, report to the community. Thank you very much. Superintendent's report, <laughs> monthly update. Good evening and welcome again to the March meeting of the Sawanica Central High School District Board of Education. Thank you very much to Dr. Dolan for that budget presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I have just a little bit more to say as follow-up. Um, as it relates to the board agenda in a few minutes, as I said, you'll hear the board rescind a retirement incentive and then act immediately upon a new one that better serves the interests of both the district and those individuals that take advantage of it. Uh, this incentive was a critical element in closing the gap in the budget, and I thank the Sawanica Federation of Teachers for their assistance in connecting it. Later in the agenda, the board will accept the resignation for the purpose of retirement for over a dozen professional educators from, district, from, from uh, the district. The number that's significant there is not the dollar amount, but rather the fact that those dozen individuals represent 404 years of service to the district, including one person who's been with us for 50 years. What a remarkable achievement. We applaud them for their service and wish them well upon the occasion of their retirement. As the board arrived this evening, they were invited to tour the new guidance suite located here at Sawanica High School. Because that construction project was done, we were able to move the library back up to their traditional location, and we saw, find ourselves here again in the boardroom. I would like to thank this building's custodial staff for prepping this room as they did for tonight and commend the Sawanica High School administration for their incredible flexibility over the last few months as this project was completed. If, if you have an opportunity to see our counseling center, please take a look at it. I think you will agree with all of us that it is a professional space that will serve our students and our staff very well. But the next construction project is already upon us, and tonight I will ask the Board of Education to approve the appointment of a project manager who will oversee the construction of the cosmetology building here at Sawanica High School. We hope that the construction will begin in late spring, and it is possible that we will finish before the end of the next school year. I will keep the community advised on its progress over the next few meetings. It's a very good time for our counseling suite to be operational, as all five of our counseling departments have been extremely busy in the midst of this college application se season. Consider this. Over the last few months, our school counselors have processed 12,533 college applications for the class of 2024. There are numerous success stories to be celebrated, and some of the earliest data reveals the schools that our students were accepted into by way of early action and early decision. It's an impressive list that includes Brown University, Cornell University, Fordham University, Hamilton College, NYU, Princeton University, Purdue University, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Rochester Institute of Technology, Villanova University, and WPI. Other decisions for students are imminent, and we congratulate each and every one of our students for continuing their education at whatever school they choose to attend. 
We also honor those students who choose to enter the military and or the workforce. Their accomplishments are, accomplishments are noted and valued as well. Our students' ability to attend the college of their choice is always enhanced by scholarship opportunities that exist. On this agenda, we are accepting a donation that will help to serve students at one of our schools, and I would like to ask Deputy Superintendent Regina Agrusa to detail this donation. Regina. Just a couple more items. Uh, just to go back to the budget for a minute, I do apologize. One of those slides, uh, it was there, but the data I wanted to share was not. Uh, I wanted to share that we have decreased our reliance upon reserves uh, from 3.6 million. Uh, we were increasing that need by 3.6 million. Now it is 2 million. So that's 1.6 million dollars less that we'll be taking out of our savings account for this budget. And while we had proposed a $4.2 million increase in the surplus applied, we've decreased that to $2.9 million. So we're relying on a lot less uh, savings and a lot less reliance on money moving forward. And I'm sorry that I did not include that in the budget presentation. Last item. As has been my practice, I'd like to offer an update on the selection of the new mascot at Sawanica High School. We are now in possession of some graphic representations of potential mascots that will be revealed next week. Video presentations are being prepared for each of the three finalists that have been chosen, and we are in the process of determining the best way to poll the community on the selection. I especially thank Nicole Allen and Christine LeCastri for the work that they have done in moving this process along, and I also note the invaluable assistance of Jostens in their facilitation of the process. We're almost there, and I do anticipate, as promised, completing this project uh, 
within this school year. Uh, I've been privy to some of the presentations and they're really exciting. Um, something to look forward to. Uh, now if there are questions the board might have about the budget, uh, the cabinet and or I will be happy to entertain them. Board have any questions? No? The audience, have any questions about what you've heard about the budget presentation or anything that we've spoken about prior to me just speaking now? Everybody's good, we can move on. Oh, great. Tiffany, Ms. Capers. The press box for Elmont Memorial. Do we have an estimated cost on that? Yes. Well, I, I know that their larger number was 720,000, yep. but uh, how much of that hmm. is the press box? I don't know if I have it or not. Let me see if it's broken down. If I don't have it, you know the board will have it tomorrow morning. Um, no, I do not have that discrete number, but I'll have it for you tomorrow morning. I'll send it to the whole board. Could I also ask, if we wait until 2025 to do the bathrooms at Elmont, will the cost go up for labor and materials? Well, we're going to bid the project now. Uh, once we bid the project, unless something absolutely extraordinary happens, the company will you know, maintain their, their commitment to that cost. Um, and I think the, the, the trade-off being not interrupting you know, school uh, would even be worth that slight increase that could occur. Hello, good evening. My name is Michaela Jasmine Beeman. Um, I have one question actually to follow up with this bathroom situation. My understanding is there were some concerns about the students being able to use the bathroom in a timely manner. So in the interim, if we were going to hope to break ground as of July 1st, 2025, what are we doing to ensure that the students are having access to the bathrooms during that period between now and July 1st, 2025? The bathroom we're renovating, the one directly across from the guidance suite, is operable now. Uh, it can be used. Um, there are bathrooms all across the building. Um, I'm not a, I've, we've heard many concerns about the bathrooms this year at various schools. I've not heard a concern that they're not available as much as concerns about their condition. Um, if there is a concern about them not being available, please bring that to the building administration. I know they would want to know. I have another question with respect to staffing. So I know one of the things you're discussing was about 404 years um, that, you know, we are appreciative of experience, but I can't help but think about like some of the scenes that I see in Abbott Elementary, of, like it's also 404 years mm -hmm. of like institutional knowledge. So I would like to know, are we considering speaking with the unions to talk about, you know, you mentioned you talk with the principal, to see if those positions are needed. But are we also bringing in the teachers and bringing in who's left? Because what I wouldn't want is for our educators to be um, pressured with a do more with less kind mm -hmm. of approach. And then our students suffer because we have one person who now is saddled with doing two and a half positions. We have a great relationship with the Sawanica Federation of Teachers. Uh, Joe Grassi, the president, uh, John, the assistant principal, the president, are in my office every couple of weeks with very frank conversations. We brought this retirement incentive to them very early, and they agreed that it was something that we could absorb. Uh, we've worked with them on staffing. We'll continue to do so. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy to tell you that Class size is going to be minimally affected, if at all. Uh, we just met with the principals last week, and we were, in, we were even in a position to say, here's some positions we didn't think we were going to keep for next year. We gave them back. Here, here's some additional staff. So I, I, the, the SFT is supportive of our efforts. Uh, they've been, we've been in communication with them every step of the way. And I also would like to thank you. The board has been very transparent. I've attended other budget presentations and, and it wasn't as comprehensive. You know, you literally um, assessed the issues. You noticed that there was a number situation and you were proactive in providing that information. So I personally want to thank you because this was very helpful for me and I have one little ask. Um, with respect to the track, yes. sometimes I notice that it's a lot of goose feces out there. 
and I'm one of the people who struggles to try to get some kind of physicality. I don't know if we can increase the frequency and when we clean the track. Um, it's kind of tough out there. there there's, it, there's, <laughs> yeah, there's all kinds of services that we have at I our don't disposal. Need that additional obstacle, okay? I got enough. <laughs> I'll see what we can do. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hello, good evening. <clears throat> My name is Shamika Talone. Um, I am a parent of a student at Elmont, and I did have some follow-up questions in regards to the bathroom situation. Um, I came and I spoke at, I believe it was the June meeting, and we talked about the need for renovations and things of that nature at Elmont Memorial. Um, as a result, we were supposed to schedule a walkthrough. Um, I was finally able to go on that walkthrough. I believe that you had touched base with the principal and that occurred in, I believe, January, the end of January. I went along with Mrs. Capers and we went on a walkthrough of the facilities as well. Um, my question had to do with the overall appearance of the building and many things that had lapsed. Um, one of those things was actually the bathroom facilities that we're discussing. Um, during that walkthrough, I did have the opportunity to visit those bathrooms that we're going to wait another year for. Um, I'm not sure, but we have been bringing this up at the school since September. Um, there is a need for some kind of resolution to be made as far as the availability of facilities and the cleanliness of those facilities and whether they are truly in operational order. Um, I can literally show you pictures of the tiles and things coming off the walls under those uh, stalls. Um, stalls that are out of order, even in the bathrooms that we're speaking of, they are, if you walk into the bathroom, rather antiqu antiquated, and you can tell that they are in need of repair. Um, the children are complaining on a daily basis. Um, along with that, I also wanted to try and find out what was happening, because I did put in a call to the central office, but no one returned my call. In regards to this bathroom situation, part of educational law states that there has to be a bathroom situation for students and they need to be available at all times. This is not the case. I have sent emails, I have come to PTSA meetings, I have expressed this openly. My child cannot be told that you cannot use the bathroom in the middle of classes during passing periods, you cannot go at the first 15 minutes, you can't go at the last 15 minutes, and then I'm receiving pictures of the lines that are there on that first floor bathroom near the main office where children are waiting 10 to 15 minutes. So then they're missing out on instructional time and that leads to issues with, between them and their teachers when they return because now there's a line to use the restroom. Using the facilities is not a privilege, it's a right. Us holding off on that bathroom situation, those two were the worst of the worst. <laughs> so it's not saying that like, oh, we're gonna start updating those. Those were literally the worst of the worst. At times when there are those 10 to, those 10 to, th to maybe 20 minute periods where they can use the facilities, sometimes they're being cleaned. Um, sometimes it may not be operational for that moment in time because there, are, there is flooding or something has gone on in the bathroom so that that is close. Children are moving from the third floor to the first floor, back up again, and this is a problem. Um, I don't know why my phone calls were never returned. I'm not sure as to what happened with that. My email was not returned. Um, and I feel like this is a major issue. I'm also encountering things such as my child sitting in a classroom with the pipes leaking from the ceiling and her being left in the classroom. I work all day as a teacher and an educator myself. 
If my child tells me I'm sitting in the classroom, there is an open ceiling and there is water dripping and splashing onto her, I feel like that's problematic. When I'm calling the school, I'm getting reports of, oh, the custodial staff knew of it, it needed to dry out, and I'm questioning, why are children in this room? If we are sitting in an entire building, there is a classroom somewhere that is not in use. Children should be moved to those locations. I felt last year as if my child was being failed, having to come into a building where it is not prioritized, that her experience is what it is at all of the other buildings within the district. And I still feel that way. So I'm going to continue to come. I'm going to show up. I'm going to email Ms. Baker. I'm going to call the central office. I can also forward those pictures to you as well. Um, but I feel like something needs to be done. I waited 60 days. I waited 90 days. I waited 120 days. And none of this is being rectified. And I feel like waiting another year is problematic. Thank you. So the bathrooms that are being done are in response to the, what was raised in September. Uh, this is our first chance budgetarily to address it, and the budgets that are be, the bathrooms are being renovated are our response to that. I'm sorry about last year. We're, we're, we're making an effort this year. And I'm especially concerned. I did see pictures of the leak, by the way. I did see that in room 239, and I, I believe that was addressed, and I'll follow up again on that tomorrow. But I am concerned to hear that you made phone calls to the central office that weren't returned. Um, I, I pride myself on that. Um, I, I seldom are people even obligated to leave a message. Joanne knows. I take the call. Um, if you didn't get a call back, I'm sorry, and I will follow up on that tomorrow and hear what your other concerns are. As far as the construction project goes, I will defer to the board, and we'll talk some more about it. I, my recommendation is that we not do construction during the school year when kids are there. If it's something we want to reconsider, I'm, I, you know, I, I have no ego on that decision. I just don't want to leave a problem for my successor. But we will talk more about it. Hi, my name is Gwendolyn Berry. I just wanted you guys to get like a better picture of what the bathroom issue is today, because how convenient, I went to the bathroom today. How surprising. Um, because human beings aren't meant to hold using the bathroom for six hours. Um, the first floor bathrooms, the first floor one by the guidance office is obviously always open. It's just always open. Um, but it's always packed, because that's the one that's most often open, right? The second floor bathroom, um, it's, it's not been used the entire year. I don't know why. Some people, someone said there was a leak. The most popular reason, supposedly, has been that the janitor doesn't get paid enough to clean all the bathrooms. I'm not sure what the actual reason is, but I'm just letting you guys know that it's always locked, so we can't get into the second floor one. And then, like she said, uh, when they get, they get cleaned, so let's say, like what happened today, uh, the first floor bathroom is packed, so obviously I'd be waiting for like 10, 15 minutes. The second floor one I can't use. The third floor one is cleaned, and they also clean the floors, so they can't let us in, because if somebody slips and falls, that's going to be on the school, and they don't want to get like sued or something. So I can't go into the third floor one. Okay, fine. The bathrooms on the other side of the school, most of them are for the PALS kids, so we're not really supposed to use those. There's the gender neutral bathroom one, but that's one stall. And I was also waiting literally the entire period. And then, like she said, then the teachers don't like trust us to go out with the past. They're like, oh, well, you took like 20 minutes last time. Yeah, because there's a really long line. I was waiting literally for 20 minutes. I was, I've talked to the security and the teachers working there, and it's always like this. So I don't, I don't know what to say. And I know Ms. Baker said that she told the teachers that they're not allowed to say no to students when they ask to go to the bathroom, but I've seen that happen on a daily basis. It's, it, they, they don't just go, oh, yeah, sure, you can go to the bathroom. They're like, no, the lesson is more important. Yeah, except I have lessons every single period, and I kind of want to eat my lunch, and I don't have a free period. So, like, I, I don't know. I don't know if you guys can do anything about that. That would be great.
Any other questions? Well, I'll just move, we'll move on. Items for board action, superintendent board action, what Dr. Dolan uh, alluded to earlier about rescinding one retirement incentive and establishing another. May I have a motion for number two, A through D? Motion, please. Ms. Rudd. Second is Ms. Peltonin. All in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Paragraph three, curriculum. May I have a motion to accept items A through O? A motion, please. Ms. Peltonin. Second, Ms. Davis. All in favor? Aye. Unanimous. Finance and operations. Joanne, just pay attention to how I'm going to do this because I'm removing one and we're going to do it after. Finance and operations, items A through H, 1 through 8, and 10 and 11, and I, use of facilities. May I have a motion, please? Ms. Rudd? Second? Ms. Davis, all in favor? Aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Item on finance and operations, H number 9. Good evening. Be it resolved that the Board of Education establish a scholarship in the name of Vinard Raghavan, class of 1997, graduate of Elmont Memorial High School. The scholarship will be awarded to four to five graduating seniors at Elmont Memorial High School at the senior award ceremony. Be it further resolved that the Board of Education accept the donation of $100,000 from Anuba Matar, Bernard's spouse, to begin the scholarship fund. The scholarship committee shall collect the award, shall select the award recipients. The funds will be deposited into the CM account. Thank you. May I have a second, please? Ms. Rudd, all in favor? Aye, it is unanimous, thank you. On personnel, items, may I have a motion on items A and B? Motion, Ms. Rudd, second Ms. Davis, all in favor? Aye. Unanimous, thank you. Support services, a motion to accept CSE recommendations. May I have a motion, please? Ms. Rudd, Ms. Peltonen, second. All in favor? Aye, it's unanimous. You have. I'll do eight, right? That's you. Seven. Item seven on the legal agenda tonight, we have a, items A, B, and C for action. So if you can do a motion for that. For A, B, and C, yes. A, B, and C. We have a motion to accept A, B, and C under, under paragraph seven legal. Motion. Ms. Cabers. Ms. Davis, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye it's unanimous. And then tonight also, um, I have two walk-in items for the board, item D and item E. Item D is hereby be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Sawanica Central High School District approves and ratifies entry into an agreement with the Sawanica Schools Employees Association regarding unit stipends. May I, I, have, a, oh, yeah, yes. May I have a motion, please? Ms. Rudd, second. Ms. Capers, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Item E for walk-in, hereby be it resolved, the Board of Ed of the Sawanica Central High School District hereby directs employee 02108 to submit for an examination pursuant to section 913 of the education law to be conducted by Dr. Randall Solomon, the district's medical examiner for examinations, conducted pursuant to section 913 of the education law. Thank you, can I have a motion please? Ms. Peltonen, Ms. Davis, all in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Old business. Good evening, everyone. I am pleased to offer this update on the superintendent search. Last September, the Board of Education embarked upon this most important task. We established a timeline that we have followed carefully and reported at every board meeting the progress we were making. Our timeline indicated that an announcement would be made at the April 17th, 2024 meeting, and we are on target to do so. We are in the final stages of this process and look forward to an announcement and an introduction 
at our next meeting. Thank you. Hello, good evening, Lynette Battle. Um, I had sent over some questions to um, Dr. Dolan. Um, let me, I have my glasses on, so forgive me. Um, so can you please share the monthly suspension data? Okay, well it says, good, after do good afternoon, Dr. Dolan. Um, I hope you can answer these questions tonight. Can you please share the monthly suspension data from this year in comparison with last year, as well as 2018 to 2019, last full year before the pandemic. And this is for Elmar High School. Yep, and I have some of the answers. I don't have the COVID years, but I certainly have the last two years. And I thank you for sending the question ahead of time because this was one that I don't think any of us could have you know, answered off the top of our head. But um, within minutes of uh, receiving the question, I received the following information from uh, Elmont High School. Uh, Mid-year results, uh, we have decreased overall suspensions by 9% from last year, same date range September 1st through January 18th, the first half of the year. Uh, in 2022-23, there were 81 suspensions. In 2022-23, there were 74 suspensions. Uh, I got a follow-up email indicating that for the second half of this year, from January 19th through March 26th, 2023, there were 66 suspensions. From January 19th to March 26th, 2024, 47, down 29%. Thank you. I will try to get those COVID numbers, but those are elusive because there was this COVID thing going on, and um, I'll do my best to, to get some data for you. Okay, thank you. Um, do we know what the percentage of current seniors are not on pace to graduate in June? So this was the one that I warned you I was going to spin just a little bit because um, I, when I posed that question to Ms. Baker, um, she indicated that two months ago, 10 letters were sent out, a total of 10 letters to seniors who were in danger of not graduating. So there's a couple of things I want to emphasize there. First, two months ago, that is by January, we're already looking at students. And, you know, we're in the second semester of their senior year. We know what's going on. Um, we're already on this case. I posed the question to another principal tonight, and she was able to identify the number of students in her building as well. This is something that we take really seriously. Um, we can predict, and with uh, the, the assistance of a, a guidance counselor, we know what's required, we know what kids need, and we know what their report cards look like up until that point. We're, we are diligent in this process, and um, I know all of our principals take it very seriously. Interestingly, um, I, I, some data came out in Newsday just this weekend. In New York State, the graduation rate is 86.4%. Long Island, it's 92.2%. Sawanica is 95.3%, above the Long Island average. And if you get a chance to look at the list of schools, they're ranked from number one to number 56. We're in some great company. You know, the schools that we're grouped with within a 0.1 percentage of, proud to be with them. And there's some schools below us that might surprise you, um, who you might think would, would outperform us. And don't forget, for us, it's five schools. It's 1,200 kids. And the bigger the group, you know, the greater the probability that you're going to have a few that don't make it. In much smaller schools, those numbers aren't as good. Um, our number, 95.3%, was a good one. And I hope to top it this year. OK. And then my last question is, any update from Section 8? And I, I did answer this one to, to Ms. Battle already. I know you had asked a question about what Section 8 was doing relative to the committee that you had formed, uh, served we on We had previously. came up with a plan of action, yep. how we could work collaboratively to stem the tide. And I and share, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, the, we haven't, there's been no contact from Section 8 on our behalf. I reached out, no response back. I called, uh, I got a response which I forwarded to you and I forwarded to the board last month. Um, that is the only contact that I have had. Okay, I just want to go on record, everybody. I, I need it on record that we put a plan together to work with Section 8, and it's a matter of time before something goes wrong again, and we haven't implemented the steps that we said previously 
to make sure we, we can stem the tide. There's been no movement, and I just want it on record. And I'll call Pizzarelli again, but there's been no movement. I, and the last thing I do want to say is our PTA meeting is tomorrow night, and I've been asked these questions by my parents, and I want to be able to give them the thoughtful cor uh, and correct answers. So thank you. I'm glad I had the data for you. Hello, my name is Fatima Bali. It's very nice to meet you. It was actually my first time in a meeting here. Welcome. Um, I actually had a question pertaining largely to my own community. I understand that this entire district has a diversity and equity requirement. So I wanted to ask a concern that a lot of Muslim students are currently facing. As you guys probably know or don't know, we pray five times a day. A lot of our students are missing class times because there is no safe space or clean place for them to be praying. I'm alumni of Salonika High School. I graduated four years ago. And in that time, we used to pray in the guidance counselor's office. And it was not clean, but we made it work. Ultimately, though, I have received, and various parents within our community have received complaints that their, student, uh, that their children are missing you know, last period, or they're missing the middle of the day, or that they're ditching. They're not ditching. They're not missing class time purposely. But they walk all the way down um, to the closest masjids, make their prayers, and then come back. So if we wanted to format something, perhaps not exclusive to the Muslim community, but perhaps a community center or space where they could come and pray, how would that work into the budget that you guys are proposing? Or how would we have to propose such a thing? Thank you. Help me understand your question just a little bit, yes. and then I'm, I'm going to talk about what I, I think uh, we're doing currently. Mm -hmm. You're asking what, how you would get into the budget, the construction of space, so for students for in students. each of our buildings? Um, in general, there's uh, the, uni the schools within this district, right? All of them have a significant Muslim population, yep. correct? Um, the vast majority of Muslims, it is imperative that we pray five times a day. It's good for our mental health. We need that connection. We value it strongly. A lot of students within my own community have come to me, and they used to ask us, what would you guys do when you were in this school? We said we prayed in the guidance counselor. You guys go pray in the guidance counselor. But for them, it's not enough. And truly speaking, I understand why. So when they ask if there's a safe space for them to pray, they're often directed to go back to those small rooms. Now we generally have a population of maybe 10 to 20 kids wanting to pray together, and there is no safe space for them to pray. So I'm trying to understand from an external perspective, could you please tell me, and can you elucidate the steps we would need to take to actually get a space for them to pray comfortably? Um, I don't like the fact that our students are being punished um, and not punished in the capacity, you know, that they're being told that they are bad people, but their performance is being punished. They lose credit, they lose class time, and all for the sake of their own religion. So if you could please provide the steps um, and break down how we could ask for a space, that would be greatly appreciated. Sure. I will answer both questions. It, if that was something that you wanted to see included in the district budget, the time to make that request, that suggestion, although the board has heard it here tonight, and, and it's, it's being heard by the community as well, would be early in the school year, September okay. or October. Okay. That is when the budget is formed. Uh, okay. That's when we start those conversations with principals about changes in their building. So let me turn to the principals. I've had this conversation with at least three of our principals who have been asked to create space. Um, I know they've found some creative solutions. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm concerned if the students feel that it's neither clean nor safe. Yeah. Um, let alone any sense that they're being punished. Mm -hmm. um, all five of our principals are here tonight, and I would encourage I those students and those parents, and I'm not shifting the blame, I'm seeing five heads are shaken, to please reach out to the principal, mm -hmm. because as much as I'm, I have 8,300 kids, I don't know them nearly as well as they know their 1,200 each, okay. or 1,500 each. So I would encourage the parents and the students to reach out as some already have. I know I'm looking at Mr. Dr. Faccio. I know he's had conversations with groups of students. Our five principals would want to hear that okay. and, and certainly would not want any student in their building to feel the way that you've described. Okay, thank you so much. And I greatly appreciate welcome. your time. Thank you. And please, next September, October? I will. That would be a great time. And, and if you can't make it to a meeting, a letter uh, to I the board? I will get a list. Of, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be funny or ridiculous. In this instance, I'm being quite clear. It's not one or two students. When it was one or two students, I was genuinely like, okay, you know, guys, you can speak with your teachers, and they will give you the time and space. 
but they have actually came and become concerned and said that this is affecting the way we are perceived in class. Mm -hmm. They say we're ditching. We're not ditching. So, so yes, thank you. Please refer them to their principal. I will. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I have one more question. Um, again, my name is Shimika Talon. Um, there was an incident at Elmont where there was an intruder in the building um, and we received notice after the fact. It said that um, none of the staff or students were in danger at any time. Um, later on, just through, I guess, questioning my own child, did I find out more details on that situation? Um, I was highly frightened at the fact that a child, because from what I'm gathering, it was, an, it was a child, not an adult, but someone could enter the building. Um, and my ch the children have ID cards. So my question was, first of all, are ID cards being checked upon entry to the school? Because that seems like a lapse in security. We have a security vestibule, but if you don't know who's coming in, then what? I said, I understand the fact that it is a child as well, but that also does not diminish um, anything. Because when you think about it, a lot of things that happen in schools and when there are things such as school shootings, a lot of times it can be the student. Um, I'm not sure of how long this person was in the school. I was told that they were walking around filming TikToks in the school with the student. Um, I'm not exactly sure of why I heard nothing in regards to a lock-in, I believe you guys call it. Um, I know in New York City Public Schools we do what's called GRP, which is, is a general response protocol. And if there is an intruder in the building, the building would go into what's considered a lockdown, and then all classrooms would have to be locked, and everyone would have to basically shelter within those rooms. So those things did not take place. I'm trying to find out what is the general response, what is protocol in the Sawanaka Central School District if there is an intruder in the building? And are these things being taught to our children? Are they aware? Because in this day and age, in all honesty, you have no idea what could happen. That was someone just coming, I don't know, for a visit, it seems. But God forbid that child had malicious intent. We could be looking at a completely different situation. So I want to know what types of protocols are in place for this um, and how we are going to ensure that this does not take place again. So some of your questions, are ID cards checked on the way in during the morning when 1,200 kids are arriving? No, they are not. Uh, students do not check individually into school. During the day, when seniors go out, they do a check back in. Um, but during the morning, uh, you know, not every kid is required to go through a single entrance. Um, we do do lockdowns and lock-ins. Uh, we do drills all the time. Mr. Green has just completed, in fact, a set of drills uh, with our, our RAVE system uh, involving a lockdown. Uh, in specifically geared towards an active shooter, uh, and that's the drill that is run. So we do have the same procedures and we do practice them. I am not familiar with the incident that you were talking about, but if you will please call and leave your number or leave it tonight, as soon as I learn more about it, I will call, I will call you tomorrow as soon as I learn a bit more about it. Okay. Um, also, um, I'm kind of alarmed. And I will also inform the board what I learned, I promise I, you. I am definitely alarmed at the part where we don't check the IDs upon entry. I literally went to high school in, let's date this, 1992. I show up at high school, they give me a card. I put the card in the little machine, it lights up green, they know I'm supposed to be there. It literally lights up red, you're not supposed to be here. It was literally across the city, 
You think of how many students there are in the New York City public school system. You can't come from August Martin to Martin Van Buren to Andrew Jackson High School and punch that card and get into the building. That does not occur because there are fail safes. So I think we also may want to think about that in the future because maybe this would help to ensure the safety of our students. I remember last year I heard people talking about armed guards and all types of things. I mean, if we could first make sure that our children, the students who attend that school, are the people who are there, I feel like that goes a long way. Hello, Michaela Jasmine Beeman from Almont again. Um, with this discussion about security, actually I, I've spoken with the board member, Tiffany Capers, about this before. I wanted to bring this to this particular board. One concern that I've always had is not just about the ID cards, which I think is incredibly valid because I similarly went to high school in the city a little bit, a little bit ago and I had a card and scanned and went in. Um, but I'm also a little concerned about individuals like adults being able to come into the school and our board of ed not really having a good understanding as to who is allowed where. So what I brought up with the Elmont uh, Elementary School Board is that a lot of individuals and I've, I've, I work in criminal justice and I've seen personally two individuals within the Elmont community, they are charged with offenses against children and then they are then put on probation. And as a term of their probation, they cannot be near a school or they cannot be near children. They're not convicted of a crime and put on a sex offense registry, which everyone all, always receives, like those SORA pe people. This is about their probation period, which sometimes is about six years. And so what is really concerning me is that if I myself am seeing people come in and they have these conditions and it's right here in our communities and our schools don't know this, then what will keep that person from coming to parent teachers conference or to the Halloween dance or to awards ceremonies? You know, so I wanted to really encourage our boards to have a good relationship with the Department of Probation so that you can know if someone in our community is under, under their supervision, has probation, that you know, so that you know to make sure that if you see this parent trying to attend a function here at the school, <coughs> alarms can go off. Because if you don't know, and you don't know to report it to probation, and probation is not telling you about it, then this parent will come in and everyone will think it's fine. If we know, we can act on it. If we, if we don't know, we can't. And we'll certainly find out from probation whether or not such a list exists. We do get sex offender notifications all the time, and we know where they live. Uh, those are the ones that are, uh, the, 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 the ones that are highlighted to us. Yes. Um, I'm not aware of anyone that we've been identified from the Department of Probation as not being allowed in our schools, but I will find out. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you all for coming. Thank you for your questions, comments, and concerns. Our next Board of Ed meeting will be held on Wednesday, not Tuesday, Wednesday, April 17, 2024, in this room right here. Thank you all for coming. May I have a motion to go into executive session? Ms. Davis, second Ms. Capers. 